All right, we're recording. Thank you everybody for joining me for session five of our online teaching academy. This is compliance part two, where we will talk about interaction, collaboration, and reflection. Last week, um, you uh, went over all the accessibility type of activities with Donna. And so today's that second piece of the compliance, which is about interaction, collaboration, and reflection. Do you all see my slide okay? A little thumbs up? Perfect, thank you. So we're gonna really look at uh, what we're talking about when I say comply, in some cases with compliance with this middle state substantive interaction. If any of you listened to this already, I just wanna let you know, this is the, identical to the session that I did during the boot camp during PD days. So some of you might've heard it in the fall, you might've heard the boot camp, but it is the same one. So, you know, I'm okay if you've already heard it and you go, okay, forget it, I'm gonna go do something else. You won't offend me. But I don't, you know, maybe there's something else to be learned. But I, this is um, pretty much exactly what I did for our boot camp over PD days. So we're going to talk about middle states compliance interaction, uh, the substantive interaction requirements. Um, we're always looking at those standards to create quality standards to meet our Oscar rubric or the, you know, uh, uh, online student quality uh, review rubric. Um, we're going to look at options for creating active learning activities and discuss ideas, uh, share ideas for meeting quality and compliance. And standards as they relate to substantive interaction, we'll do that in, that will be part of the activity uh, that goes along with this live session, you know, for the week. And hey, we're at session five, there's only one more to go. So we're, we're getting near the end of, um, you know, the, the training coming up and we'll be wrapping up our semester before you know it. One of the things we've been doing was talking about instructional design is I just want to bring your attention. We have been using what's called this ADDIE model um, and that's analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. And we really have been kind of following this as we've been going through these modules. Um, you know, so I just wanted just to bring you aware of that. If you've ever heard of this instructional design model, that's kind of what we're doing. In the very end, you know, we're, we're right here. We're, we're still developing and starting to implement, like creating these activities. And we'll be doing a little evaluation of what we've done through that semester in the end. So always the fun stuff, compliance. Don't you love to hear that word? Tad, doesn't that word make you happy? I see your face, Tad. It's make you just want to smile and yeah, right. Static. Yes, so compliance. I mean, we've got compliance for everything. SUNY standards, Department of Education, state ed, middle states. And basically what they're looking at is, um, you know, this meeting regular interaction or what they are calling substantive interaction. And that's student to student, student and instructors. So we can read this slide all day long. And obviously it means we're creating and providing and promoting and proactively engaging with our students. Um, we're providing a way for them to interact with one another. So I wanna show you this. This came from an earlier session today uh, from the SUNY Doodle meeting that somebody shared. Um, and Empire State created this image, this slide. And I think that this, um, I didn't have time to get it into our slideshow, but I, I will for the future. Uh, it's not the highest resolution image, but I think, do you see that image on the screen? It looks like a gauge. Okay. You know, um, I think it gives a really good depiction of what, what we mean by substantive interaction. Um, if you look here, correspondence education and go all the way over to the here is distance education. And so when you just have automatically graded quizzes um, and you got some video lectures, right? So to me, this looks like publisher content watch the video, maybe do an automatic grade, you're running what they consider a correspondence course. There's really no interaction student to student. There certainly really isn't any, any, um, any instructor presence, no teaching presence, right? So, which we'll talk about next week in more detail, but that's where we're on this gauge of it's not really meeting the standards in any way, shape or form of a true online or distance education. Now you start move through the gauge, you'll see these are weekly assigned announcements of due dates. A lot of us do that. Post announcements, I send them via text, I send via announcements. Uh, that's me, you know, engaging with them, but I can even pre schedule them before the semester starts. I mean, if you really want to, you can. But now you've got graded assignments without feedback. We're still in the fair zone, right? When we're not really giving them feedback. But we're starting to move to where we want to be or we want you to be in teaching in these blended and hybrid and online modes as graded assignments with feedback. Now, one of the best ways to give them a good graded assignment with feedback is have a rubric for your assignments. 
that shares, clearly identifies the um, the expectations. And then you can, uh, if you've ever done um, uh, a session with Donna on rubrics or me, well, we have some great recordings. You know, they're easy to build in Blackboard. Uh, it makes it very simple to grade. And then you want to give good feedback. Even if you don't have a rubric, which is highly recommended, then even just giving good feedback, not just, um, you know, perfect, well done. Giving some good feedback from the instructor starts to move you towards this gauge. Now we see weekly announcements explaining content. I know it's hard to see in here. So when you start giving a little bit of a, you know, little kind of mini, mini lecture with some information inside an announcement, uh, or along with a little video or something, a uh, video lecture, now you're starting to provide more opportunities for substantive interaction. Offering those office hours. Now, you might have given office hours on your course information document the first day of class, but do you continue to offer them? Are you offering even optional live ones? Uh, I find that those, you know, I don't, right now, this time of semester, I think students need a break and we didn't have our spring break. I know we're all looking for a break, but, you know, people get tired. Everyone gets a little tired and then the weather changes a little bit, but I still try to offer those office hours. And sometimes I try to put some topics on there. Like tomorrow, I'm going to talk about our final project. So I, I put an, an optional live office hour out there. So try to give a little topic. So maybe if you're working on something in class, you know, they might have some hard time if you give an optional session. I used to do mine at 1230 because that's when I used to teach the class on campus. I started moving them to 3, 330 and I get more students to log in because their classes are done for the day, maybe somewhere around three, maybe it's when they're done with their classes for the day, but before they might do a part-time job in the evening, whatever it is, I've had good luck at three o'clock. Three o'clock when, when I'm most tired for the day, that's when it's the best time to do training for faculty. I really should work like different shift. And then it's the best time for meeting students. But anyway, you know, so sometimes these office hours can help you to, to have that. And then instructor, instructor initiated discussions. And also there are other kinds of discussions too that can get students to interact with students. So I just thought this image was um, a, a pretty good gauge. I would probably be able to add some other things to it if I created one, which isn't a bad idea. It's got me thinking when I seen this today, but I think it gives a, a good idea of what is expected in relation to meeting substantive interaction. In the course, I provide you a link to this so you can go read more about it. You know. Um, there's some more FAQs about from Middle State, um, but hopefully you kind of trust what I'm guiding you towards. So basically we're going back to Oscar again, and now we're looking at uh, the content and activity section. So really when you offer a variety of engaging resources that facilitate feedback and communication collaboration, you're really supporting um, that effort of meeting that compliance or substantive interaction. You know, we're always um, a good idea to try to get students to um, critically think, right? Or critically reflect and analyze. So, you know, you can use case studies, um, reflection journals, other problem solving skills in the math and sciences. You're always having students who problem solving, practice with problem solving skills. Um, and then anytime you can have some an activity that emulates a world, real world application, say that three times, um, you know, it's always helpful. So this links out to that section again in uh, Oscar that talks about each of these. And remember, when you go out there, if you click on that link, each of these items will expand and provide more detail. I showed you that two weeks ago. Then in the, uh, there's the Oscar piece on interaction itself, right? So one is you got to give these expectations to students, make sure they're, uh, you know, what, what, you know, how often you're going to give feedback, um, you know, and give them the expectations for what your timely response will be. Anytime you're gonna have students interact with one another, we always re recommend you provide them some information on um, uh, the netiquette that's expected, the expectations. We've had it as part of our template. So if you, we had a netiquette document or link, if you didn't get that, uh, Donna can clearly can send that to you. Anytime that you can give students an example of what you're expecting or what might be a high end or a good discussion or, or whatever it is you're doing, a good reflection journal, a good, you know, it could be any kind of activity. Um, you want to always, if you have good examples from previous students, I always ask if I could use a couple and then I share them um, with the future class. 
So like I was just giving uh, my students an example of for tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about the final project. And I give five, always five, exempt, just, you know, that projects that were amazing, uh, their websites that they build, uh, it's a web tech course. But, um, you know, five to, to explore so they know exactly what I'm looking for. When I do discussions in the beginning of my class, you know, up front of the semester, I give them a couple examples of what's a really good discussion and what's not. So for any assignment you have, especially any of those really um, uh, key activities that, you know, weighted heavily on their grade, anytime you can give them an example, that's going to be helpful. Uh, the course here, number 42, should offer um, opportunities for learner to learner interaction and constructive collaboration. So most of us think that that's got to occur just by a discussion forum, but there are other ways to do that. So we're going to talk about some of those ideas and share some of those ideas in the, this weekly topic that we have. And again, we could go to interaction. I'm going to try to click on it and see if it comes up. Does that show up in the window? Okay, we're going to do another. You know, so again, when I say learners have an opportunity to get to know the instructor, do they have that warm up activity where you are included as part of a video and maybe a discussion about, you know, that's, you know, one way. Um, so when I look at 42, here's, it will open up again. I showed you this two weeks ago, but it'll give you examples for how you can do that. Uh, and refresh your course with these ideas. So some of you who might be thinking about refreshing your course as we go through these standards should definitely be kind of looking at this. Um, and so I wanna just point this out and I wanna do it for a reason is that, you know, there's other ways to have just discussions than just posting some basic topic. Um, you can have debates, have, they can create a pre presentation, a voice thread or other tool. And a voice thread, you post something they can, they can they can do an audio file, an, a video file. Um, they could do um, text. So there's collaborative bookmarking. I have my students use Digo. We collaboratively bookmark for the class. It's very similar to I had you sign up to receive my bookmarks for the Online Teaching Academy. My students and me, we actively engage in all bookmarking in our DIG class. So that's a way that we're interacting with each other. So it's not all by just, a, a, you know, some students find those bo discussion boards, some boring in some instances. Case studies are always good. Uh, make sure you're using strategies for open-ended, uh, more brainstorming questions. Uh, make sure you're grading a discussion post or it's not worth it. Um, and help to focus the discussions. Now, You'll notice that everyone, a lot of these have this TOPR, and this is Teaching Online Pedagogical Rep Repository from the University of Central Florida. Um, they give some really great ideas for using some of these other tools to think about how I can do that. So a voice thread for online debate, social networking tools to facilitate small group problem-based learning, social bookmarking to organize and share online resources. This, this link here, which is part of what we're gonna do in the online portion throughout the week, can be very helpful in kind of giving you an idea for how can I, you know, I'm doing something that doesn't seem to be working. How might I be able to refresh it or build it differently? So make sure that you think when you go to Oscar in any one of these parts, every item has, you know, more details when you expand it. I use a tool called Padlet. I want to show it to you quickly because I'm going to do a session on it next Monday at two. And I'm gonna talk about using VoiceThread and I'm gonna talk about using Padlet. I've used them on Padlet. My students are doing really well with them like that. I'm just gonna log into it to show you an example. But if you remember being on our all faculty meeting this term, we were, kept, we were asked to do, kept putting stuff on a board. Does anyone remember that from the all faculty meeting? We had that training and they would ask us to post out on the board. Well, they were, I, I loved it. So I said, hmm, what are they using? Well, here it's called Padlet. Um, and you can, oh my God, oh, I archived one, didn't I? Is this my archived one? Yeah, there it is. Okay. I guess I got to unarchive it to show you. which of course I don't really know how to do. I did make a new one. Well, this, it's a board. You could create this board and I wanna show, I'd like to show you for money and I'll show you the archive one I did. And then I could post anything on this Padlet. I can make it like, a, if I make it, I can make it look like a wall, a canvas, a stream, a grid, a timeline, a map, 
a back channel, a shelf. Back channels, if you, if you put a padlet up in the back um, while you're presenting or something, if you have a big classroom, they can put questions and notes on it. So I did a wall and my students posted projects to it. They all did their own little project and then they all posted the link to it here and every person could comment. They could comment, they could use video, they could make a, a screen capture video right from it. Um, they could make comments. I can choose whether they like, you know, like it with stars or things like that to do kind of their own rating. So if you would like to learn more um, with just, just a different and fun way to still get students to interact, um, I, I'd be gonna be showcasing this on Monday. Uh, my session is Monday. 29th from two to three. And it's really going to be about alternatives to the traditional online discussion forum. I'm going to show you a couple ways, other tools that I've used to really get students engaged, um, more so than just using the Blackboard discussion tool. I also use some journals in my class that I get really good uh, feedback on. So I'm going to, you know, have that prepped and ready to show you those examples. Voice thread will be one. Padlet, and then how I use just um, the the journals. I use a blog for them; works pretty well. So I'll have dot obviously send a re an announcement and reminder, but um, just so that we could talk about. There's just not enough time today to talk about all of those things, but I'd love to show you some uh, um, options, and then you can certainly you know use anything that you might want to try. So. We're back on our slide. So, so what we're really talking about is no matter what we choose, we want to look at Bloom's taxonomy. Um, you know, if you look at this, this is called the learning pyramid and Bloom's taxonomy looks from the bottom to the top. Uh, and the bottom, this is where it's the lowest level of learning, recalling facts and basic concepts. Define, duplicate, list, memorize, repeat, state. That's going to be remembering. And you can see as you go up the level of learning to the highest level is when they can create something produce a new or original work. So we're really trying to get a good mix in our classes for students. We do not want them to just be remembering. We need them to remember, understand, apply, and obviously um, create when and if they can in any particular course. And I'm having my students right now choose to, uh, from five options on a social media project. There's six, six forms of social media, you know, one social networking, one social opinion, that kind of thing. Um, and I want them to explore a common tool. And they've got to produce um, either an infographic, which is pretty cool. I give them some tools to do that, a video, a how-to and an animated video. I give them a couple options. And um, because I want them to be able to do all the research and take the, you know, how many people are using it? How is it using education or business and industry and, and create something? I don't want them to type it up. I want them to be creative and learn to use these tools that exist. It's a web tech course. But regardless of being a web tech course, I give no other instructions but a link to each to the tool. I give them some options for tools and I tell them that if they have another one, they can use it and only to their help menu. Every help menu has all the videos every student needs to, for them to do it. And I never get any questions about how to do it. Uh, and they come back with the most amazing creative projects and then I have them share it in a Padlet and then we discuss it. So I'm trying to make, they, they, I think they do far more learning the way I set up the project and the activity. And I think they engage with it far more because it seems to be more fun and exciting and engaging for them. Um, they say, well, I never heard of an infographic. So I show them what they are and they're like, ooh, this is cool. And I give them two free tools to do it. Uh, and so they come up with some pretty creative stuff. So I do have them do some remembering in the course. It's an intro course, right? They all have to remember some common terms and facts. But I do feel like I'm having them do evaluation of each other's work, applying what they learn in these tools and, and creating and designing something new. So I want you to think about Bloom's taxonomy as you're thinking about these activities that you chose to map out to your student learning outcomes. This is a different, just a, a different way. This is now, now we're looking at reading at the, when we're at this highest level of this, it's actually it's supposed to look more like a cone than a pyramid. But I wanted to share it because to, just to keep in mind that 10% of what a student reads is what they'll remember, right? So this is the opposite of these going up that learning curve. Um, they'll remember 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, 50% of what they see and hear, and 70% of what they say and write, and 90% of what they do. Um, 
because of this is why I have students do my learning journal and what I ask them to provide me. And they can provide me far more information and even create digital artifacts to go on it to show me what they're learning. And by doing it, they oftentimes will come back and say, I went and saw my family member. I went and showed somebody else how to do that. If you can teach something to someone else, then you can truly remember it. So um, when you look here, this is that defined moment, right? Bottom of the pyramid. Here's where we demonstrate apply and practice when we just watch a video, watch a demonstration. We're starting to move up the learning pyramid. But when we're designing and there's simulations, models, experience or designing um, and presenting or doing the real thing, then we're really at that higher level of learning up here. So we want them to be active learners and actively engaged in the course. Um, and so, you know, as Benjamin Franklin said, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. So, you know, you can't just open a bucket and pour knowledge into a student's head and say, remember these facts. It just doesn't work. They might cram, they might stay up all night and drink no dose or whatever, there's little shots of five hours something energy and try to remember them for a test in the more, you know, to get the right answer and remember nothing after that. That does nobody any good in a pre prerequisite course. It does students no good when they really need it to, you know, if they're, um, you know, progress through their education. So we're trying to make sure we build things to, to promote active learning. So I think that this kind of infographic, this is a simple, one form of an infographic, um, says, you know, active learning engages students in the process, uh, uses a variety of activities. So when we build a full online course, we're always looking for people to have a variety of activities, hence those plans that many of you created. Some of you are doing blended and, and hybrid, I understand, but you do have the online piece to that course, or you should have, and that's where you can do a variety of things, such as reading, writing, discussion, problem solving, um, you know, promote, promoting analysis, synthesis, and, that, and evaluation of content. So there's lots of ways to do that. And so this is just a good slide to provide um, some ideas. And you have access to the slide deck, so you can always look at it. So some, just a few examples of some active learning uh, examples are, um, you know, in discussions. So we've had some people say, you know, but my, my class or the type of class, it really makes it difficult. Well, you can always just go to that muddiest point or key concepts and takeaways, you know, from this material that we did, what's the key concepts or takeaways you got? What's your muddiest point means? What do you need further clarification on? I have this is just part of, it's one question. It's actually two questions as part of my reflection learning journal blog I have students do. And they always have something that's a muddiest point. That's a great way for me to engage with my students and be interactive with them because I try to answer and clarify it guide them to resource, create a video, point them to a video, whatever it is. I like to know what they, what they are struggling with. And if I see multiple students provide the same muddiest point, if you will, I know I better do a better job on my materials up front. Maybe something's, I'm not, you know, being as clear as I think I should be. There's always a one minute paper. I'm going to show you a link to something where you get some ideas on this one minute paper, journals, or mid-semester reflections, or even after a few weeks, there's peer review, and many, many more. I have a link inside the module that you're going to be able to go look at and look at some other ideas as well. So now discussions, regardless of the tool you use, what's the point of the discussion? It's obviously to pr promote community, social interaction, collaboration, and you can see sharing knowledge, reflections, improving critical thinking, and providing clarification. I see, Donna, you wanna, I think I see something blinking with the chat. You wanna um, go ahead and share what I should? It's, it's just me, I'm posting all the links to all the resources. Oh, thanks. I just seen it flash, so I wanna make sure I wasn't stopping. Okay, yep. um, is there any other questions? Well, I did stop for a second. I could, or we can continue to move on and talk about it. Nothing in chat. All right, thank you. So obviously these are the reasons we use discussions. So some of the benefits uh, is that in, in these online discussions, there is 24 seven interaction. You know, students who take, if they, especially if they're taking an online course, uh, you know, you don't know what time or day or when they might be able to interact, but they're not just put on the spot. I mean, I have had so many times, I know you've all had it. You ask a student in class a question and they don't know what to say. 
um, you know, or the same person's constantly trying to reply to any questions and that sort of thing. Um, it gives them opportunity to take some time to think before they respond, right? They can do some exploration, research the material, um, and then, and, and hopefully give, you know, some better feedback that way. It also is a great extension of any face-to-face -face or blended hybrid course, right? Um, you can start a discussion in class or in your synchronous live session on Zoom and have it move to online so there can be further exploration uh, that way you in further discussion. You could start it online and then come into class to do a summation of it, which is a great way to sum, you know, if I have students do, a, I've done this for face-to-face -face for homework, I have an online discussion forum because I want them to go out and research and they have to find some materials. Um, I'm, sometimes it's within the library databases, other times it's on, you know, searching the web or whatever it is. And that's like their entrance ticket. They get a grade for that. And then we, I, you know, because I make them post by the night before, I've already kind of looked at it and I have an idea of the themes that have come up from what they've shared. Uh, and then it helps me to guide that discussion and, and do a more of a summative overview with the class during, during the class time. So either way, it could be uh, very beneficial to those kinds of classes. So here's a really good slide and just some of the application ideas for building online discussion. Um, case scenarios can be great. Uh, not every course is going to have case scenarios, but when you do, a lot of publisher content and they do have them. It's a great way for students to have to apply those theories and concepts that is providing the reading. Uh, I know that these are using a lot of these biz the business courses works very, very well. Brainstorming, you know, there's, you know, it could be pre-class or post-class activity where they, they, you know, format to brainstorm an idea on a topic. Uh, sometimes role playing in small groups or if the course is small. I've seen this done um, through uh, some history courses, right? Kind of role playing the key, you know, people within the history, you know, text and materials. Um, I've seen that. Reaction postings where the students can react to something they read, assign readings, websites, or discussion questions that were related to the course textbook and provide the basis for the discussion. So those that can be um, one way to do it. Key takeaways, as I mentioned. Key takeaways just seems like it will, it will always work in almost any class or your muddiest point. Um, also, you know, if you use this in a discussion form, then their classmates can help. It provides a way for students to engage with each other about providing, uh, trying to provide the clarification on something that a student might be struggling with. Um, and then, you know, yeah, so maybe they won't answer it perfectly, but that's where your job is to be monitoring that and interacting and letting someone know, you know, you, you know, you know, you know, thank you for this or helping, whatever. But, you know, did you, you got to kind of guide them, you don't want to tell them they did something totally wrong, but um, to, to guide them in the right direction. So this is a good way to get some of that kind of interaction happening as well. Obviously, they can be used to expand course content, right? They might read different articles or post summaries or find different websites or post links, and they can, they can react to that. You can even use it to share, like if students do projects or uh, we've seen them do papers or, you know, all kinds of, you know, maybe even a case study, maybe they have to read and reply and, you know, based on a rubric is how would they have scored them and why and apply what theories. Uh, and then you can come and chime in. So that, that's worked as well. And in, in some, I've seen that work in, in certain classes too. And like I said, extending in class discussion. If you've got to cut off a really good discussion because the class time's over, bring it right online and you can bring up back and some, you know, do a summation um, if you need to at a future class as well. This is just a, some ideas of alternatives for discussion. Now, once you kind of say which ones you'd like to try, you know, there's a variety of tools to use. There is a traditional discussion forum, but that's not the only way you could do this. I do a brainstorming activity, doing one right now through a Google document. Uh, I made a Google document that anyone, me and my class can edit. Uh, the students put their name and they're all typing on there and commenting, boom. Within two days, we create an entire document for the entire class. You could have it be a, 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 a you could have it be a collaborative study guide. Um, you know, I've seen people do it like you have to add two, what do you think two good test questions would be? And, um, you know, I've even been in a class when I was in um, 
I forgot what I, I might have even been graduate school, but we had to come up with the questions and then our, our professor made the exam based on some of them. That, but um, it became a, 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 we did a, it was a collaborative kind of study guide. So there's lots of ways to do that. And there's lots of tools. You don't have to just rely on a basic discussion form, but it can be done. But there's other tools, like I mentioned, Padlet, um, journals through blogs and other tools, um, or even um, even using Google Docs as a, a journal where that you can you can just click on it and comment. I mean, you know, Google Docs is one of the most amazing tools you have with all the features and tools that are for free out there and for students. And if you're not familiar with that and you want to learn more about that, we can get we can help you with that, no problem. So again, speaking of these kinds of, if you want to learn some other tools that can help to, to deliver the discussions and facilitate them, right? Um, and they're easy to use and free, then we can talk about those on Monday if you join me at my two o'clock session. So we talk about learning styles, really, you know, the students are gonna, they learn in a variety of ways. If you have a variety of activities, it does two things. One, it ha probably helps students with the different learning style that they might have. And also the more different, you know, the kind of difference, different activities you can provide to students um, also helps tremendously to reduce technology enhanced cheating. It's hard to cheat in an online course when they have to actively engage in all of these different activities. Um, if they have to just do a quiz and, and, you know, one activity each week, one, it probably won't be qualified as a really true, you know, remember the scale, you know, the, the, the gauge, uh, true online course, but um, also it opens the door for um, opportunities for technology enhanced cheating. So here's a couple examples of discussions. Now this is, um, these are examples that faculty and people have shared with us. We have a view more, so because I'm going to show you some, but um, you know, so for this discussion, there's two parts. First, your main post. Second, two replies to your classmates. Um, here's, I would like you to explain your own words, you know, um, what was the two most significant. So this is like we're using those key takeaways, right? I'd like you to include what your, what is your money's point? What's the most difficult or confusing part of the lecture lab or reading in the course materials? This was from a, uh, I believe Donna, wasn't this, was this from a um, chemistry course, I think? Yes, it was. And then you could see how they have these replies. Uh, what you see is, for example, that uh, would take the time to read your classmates, what's the reply, more information. For example, provide them with information that could be helpful with what they listed as their muddiest point. Explain what helped you understand the topic and include a link to resources on the web that you feel could explain the topic better. It could be an article, a video, or an experiment about a topic covering the module. I love that. Here, you're clearly telling students Go research it a little more and try to help that student with the muddiest point. Yes, you're the teacher and can do it. But if they're out exploring, they're learning more about the topics that you want them to learn more about, right? So if you remember, if you can learn and teach it to somebody else, it'll help you to remember it. It's one thing to you know remember it for short term. It's another to remember it long term. And, and you're not limiting them to what they can find. And you'd be surprised at sometimes how what good resources students can actually um, uh, locate for you. <laughs> I, I find them to be uh, the best curators of information. Um, sometimes they'll find videos or other information I think is better than some things I had in some of my materials and then I'll switch it out. And I would say thank you. Thank you for finding that for me. And they like that, but um, they do. They do a pretty good job at curating that. So here's a link to view more. This is going to be part of what you'll be exploring for this, this week's activities. Um, but you'll see there's some examples and there's more examples here right for you to look at so um here's some tips where can you get these discussions textbooks the publisher materials usually have things to make it for really good stick or be student-led discussions or teacher-led so um the, the information right from within those textbook readings perfect publisher content has that instructor resources area that sometimes we don't often look into enough that's got some great examples for every subject. And because some will say, I just don't know how to do that with the subject I teach. Well, let's look at the materials and see what we have there. We can probably come up with something. Literature-based, find something. They can find existing discipline-specific literature to prove or disprove, agree or disagree, or expand upon the concept under discussion. You know, 
some of these materials are always um, something the library's always willing to help you find. And they also have, you know, both literature and non-literature based materials, so videos, podcasts, surveys, interactive scavenger hunt scenarios created by the teacher. All of these are ways to get them engaged in these activities. So we don't just have to, you know, the trick is to learn how to build the discussion and give the best instructions to students and guiding them. Because when you think they might know what to do without you giving them those details like this, see, very detailed in the, in the replies, then sometimes you won't get the best high quality responses because the students don't just don't know what, they don't know what the expectation is. So, you know, a lot of people always ask me, what's a one minute paper? That's quite interesting. You know, one minute paper could be something that they just turn in for grading after a class or in a module. It's something that you could do as an activity in a learning module, or it's something you can even, you can even build into a, a class engaging activity for, um, uh, you know, at the end of a blended class, you could be using Padlet and ask them to put, post that on the Padlet. It's real simple to post on it. And I'm gonna show you how to do that on Tuesday. Uh, you know, take one minute. What's the biggest point you learned today? What's the main one answer question? That's really all a one minute paper is. So if you're teaching a blended class or hybrid, you can have them, you know, back when I earlier, when, you know, I mean, when I was in coming here, which was a long time ago, we used to put post-its on a board before we walked out of class. And that was, they called it the parking lot, but we were doing the same thing. Biggest point, main unanswered question. And then I, the teacher would grab them and help us the next class, right? But now we have online, so we can build, you know, use these online tools to do it. We could use Padlet, which is a board. It is, think of it. It was like taking a post-it note and putting it on a board it's just that you can type it up or whatever, and, you know, and then I can look at those questions or I can have students look at the questions and help to respond. You can build that any way you want. Or you could just do it at the end of a blended class um, just so you can, you know, account for their engagement during the class as well. You could do it just in the chat feature or you can use Padlet, which students seem to think they seem to like it. That Padlet feature, the Padlet tool I showed you, you can archive it, make a PDF of it and share it with the whole class. Um, I have all that saved, so I'm gonna show you that um, on Monday. Pretty neat. So here's a link these, uh, so you, a little more. This was from a slide share that I used. It's Harvard one minute paper. So the link on this slide deck has more information to learn about these one minute papers if you were interested in doing so. And you'll have, you have the slide deck to go through any of these links. Now I do a learning journal in my class. Um, you know, what is it? I explain this. This is the beginning of what I'm explaining to my students an exercise in metacognition, no matter what. It's a way for them to kind of remember what they're doing. If they can continually demonstrate, you know, what they're learning. My hope is they'll learn, they'll be able to remember a good amount of what they learned in my class. So here's an example of, you know, a, a learning journal activity. Here's the instructions. Now my students are in a web tech course. I make them create a blog and they make eight entries, each module to that blog. At the end, they have an entire blog of what they learned up with eight posts to their blog. And they have it with them and they can keep it and they can use it in their digital media portfolio class. It's, it's a digital artifact. They can show what they've done in the program. You could have students do this in a Google Doc. You could have them do it in a journal tool in Blackboard. I just like the blog because they, you know, they can give a theme and a color and they can, it's really simple to use and they can keep posting to it. Um, and then they have that blog from my class. So you don't have to make it in a blog, but it's just one way to do so. But here's what is important. I need to know what did they learn? And it's got to reflect on the content, the learn, if you, your entry must include detailed information from the content in the learning module, the discussion board, readings, the lessons, or another supplementary materials. So um, it's got to come from all the pieces, all the activities I do in my class. And I have a rubric that grades them on this portion. Um, Sometimes in each journal entry, I ask for specific information. This one was journal number one. I did ask them what was their muddiest point. Is there anything else they didn't understand? Do they feel comfortable navigating Blackboard in the course? If not, how can I help you? Remember, this is the, like the first module one, right? I want to know now if they have 
you know, and how do you prefer to receive my reminders? Text, the announcements, and course, T Wolves email another. Uh, hands down, 100% text. I get great feedback from that. My students ask me questions on text. Um, if I remind them assignments due, all of a sudden I start seeing things submitted um, more so than when I do an announcement. I do an announcement and a text. It don't take me very long. It's a copy paste for me usually, but um, the text and remind works. I make them add digital learning facts. I show them videos. In my course, they're always created. They create videos, screencasts. They make infographics. Sometimes they, they make their own, uh, like an Animoto video and stuff that they love. Um, or there might be videos that I've shown them or completed that help them learn the material. They have to embed some of those in their blog entry. They got to comment on their own participation and they have to give me four words, terms, and definitions. So here's an example of a really good, and I give examples too to students. This is what this is what a good example should look like. So this is from a learning journal too and a previous, you know, from a student. I always get permission. Um, so you see, when they do a blog, it gets archived. They can always go back to their first ones to the last one. So she commented on her parts on what she learned in this particular module, added some digital artifacts to it. Um, more than a couple. She had some videos about that helped to learn that material. Um, this video is one she found on her own that I actually ended up putting into my lesson because it was better than the one I had, which was great. See, so yeah, students are great curators. Uh, she liked to do in the screencasting lab. It's how I taught them how to make a screencast video. Um, and, you know, here's your four terms and response on participation. To me, this took this takes a good amount of time to do. You had to go through all the material in the learning module to do it. Um, I, I count this more than I do a test in my class. Show me what you learned. I do quizzes, but I drop the lowest two. I do it just to get them to do the reading, but I do things like this. <coughs> Excuse me, let me just take a drink here. To, um, they really had to learn something to be able to, to do a journal entry of this good. Now, I do not have students comment on each other's learning journals. I have heard that before, you know, so they could post. Maybe it's not a bad idea. Maybe that would be a great way of getting students to interact. Uh, I just have not set that up. But I've been participating in a couple of sessions from some, you know, Donna and I do some PD from places that offer things around the country. And I have seen that. Um, I have seen it set up in Google Docs because you can set it up for people to comment or small groups to comment but I have not done it with these blogs. This is between me and the student and I really do give good feedback based on this. This is where I mostly engage one-on-one -on -one with the student would be through that learning journal that I get in each module. So that's an example. And this was just another example from another student. You know, so they get to choose their theme. It's reflected on what he learned, some digital artifacts. Um, this was, you know, just another, it was really detailed and um, it was a really good posting. So I give, I usually provide students um, four to five examples. I just pulled out two for the purpose of this, but four to five examples to look at. Then I don't have to spend how much time after the first learning journal explaining that it's not close to what I was looking for. Show them what, what, what you're looking for. Um, if you have them, a seasoned course, you always got with some good examples. So when I see something good, I don't hesitate. I ask permission right away. I store it and I, I make use of it. It's one way to constantly refresh your course and keep it kind of fresh that way. So a mid-semester reflection, if any of you have ever had an online course observation by Loretta, who used to work with us, who lives out in Colorado now, <clears throat> she is one of the best at giving feedback to faculty on ways to improve course, refreshing them, or, you know, um, being more actively engaged or, you know, building your teaching presence, if you will, which we're going to talk about more next week. But she's uh, constantly saying, here's an example of something you can do uh, instead of reflecting all the time, maybe just a mid-semester reflection. I don't do a mid-semester reflection. I do uh, about week two, and I want to know how they're doing because sometimes I think mid-semester might be too late to find out some information that they might need. But um, she's got this, it's just take a half hour or so. And she gives an example 
of her mid. This is Loretta's mid semester reflection. What you know, exam what's required, how to submit it, um, and list the steps. So this is here for anyone who might be interested in that. You can copy it, take it, make it your own. Here's an example from of, about a different style of reflection. Now, I did the journal that's every module, every two weeks, comes out to seven or eight for the semester. I do seven. The eighth one, I make them reflect on the course, and then they uh, they ref, they have to do a paragraph on if you what what um if what what information would you provide to uh, a, you know a next semester student um, you know with tips and those kind of things. So they reflect on the course. So it's pretty, you know, when you say, if you get students to keep going back over the material, the more they do, they might remember it. I make them, cause they have to go back over their seven individual reflection journal entries to make the eighth one, which makes them go back over and refresh themselves with the material. And then they do that. Uh, the last one is about the course. And then tips for, for future students. Now here in my, in this, this is an example from uh, Rich Harrington's course, a criminal justice course. And um, he does a reflection on his chapters. So he's got a reflection assignment that's worth hundred points. He has a really good rubric for this and we have it if anyone was interested, but he makes them just, this is an assignment to him. So the student types it up in Word or, you know, right on the Blackboard thing or whatever. and it's just a submission to him. And that he does ask for some key takeaways, muddiest points, key terms and definitions. But he then will give responses with the rubric and feedback instead of them having to a journal. But he does it this way. But either way, he's still having them reflect on the material so he can provide um, you know, some good feedback to them and help definitely help to clarify um, anything that might need clarification. So there's a lot of ways to do that. So some other types of feedback type reflections could be, what do you like about the activity? Uh, what do you think you learned from it? What was most challenging? How did your fellow group members help you in your learning? And then, you know, when it comes to overall course reflection feedback, we have smart evaluations. So you're allowed to add a, um, a couple of questions to it yourself. There's an opportunity, they, Academic Affairs sends it out and gives you a chance to add a couple of questions if you want. If you're teaching blended or hybrid or high flex or you know any of these formats are online, you know maybe you want to ask a couple specific questions to get yourself some feedback to see how it goes. You can do so. It's up to you. I know they give us a, a, an opportunity to to add some of them. All right. So what I'm going to do is just go out there because it's quarter two. I'm gonna show you what materials we have for this module. All right, we're gonna go right to the next steps. We're gonna view the resources. And then we've got you know, an activity and a discussion to do. A lot of the links that Don has been sharing today are also in the slide deck and also in the material for you if you want to explore any one of them in any more detail. And then if you want to learn some of those other tools, I will record it. I know not everyone could join me at two o'clock on Monday the 29th. I'll send the Zoom link out to the group, to the every, any faculty, any, the whole college I'll send it to. Whoever would like to learn more about that, we'll do VoiceThread Padlet, so we can do a little on journals if you want to. Um, and, you know, I'll have you actually, I'll show you how you can participate in the Padlet too. Um, and that's Tuesday at two, but I'll share the, you know, the recording if we don't if you can't make that. Okay, so we're gonna be finished. We're gonna work on module five. Next week, we're gonna talk about that online teaching presence and effective course management. Um, the slide deck is right here that I showed you. And then I will replace the recording, today's recording here. This is from the session we did during PD days, right? We keep just doing the last one is there until we, we change it. So we'll have this one, I'll have this one up later today. So here in module five, um, you know, we've got this, again, I'll have the new updated recording here for you. I did, you know, talk, we talked about the outcomes. So we've got the live session. Uh, you're gonna be creating a discussion, a plan or a list of things you'd like to do in your course to meet compliance and quality standards. 
and you know, so that's what the discussion is. Explore some of these things and think things you might want to try. Last time we ran this, we had so many great ideas coming from each other. Uh, people were really sharing some good, good tips. Some that, um, you know, Donna and I even made use of. And then you're going to create one discussion, collaborative assignment, or reflection assignment in your course for the assignment to turn in. You pick one, right? That will be the assignment. So I have you going to look at the Oscar standards. And when you click on any standard, it expands to give you ideas. You know, pick one. If you want to come up with more than one because you want to get our feedback on it, like you'd like to say, here's an example of discussion I'm going to use, and here's an example of reflection assignment, or here's an example case study, you can submit more than one to me and we'll give you feedback. We're just requiring one for the purpose of training. And the discussion is about how you, after doing the session and exploring the material, you see the resources in this module, this link I have here? It's going to take you to a Digo list that I put together specifically for just module five. So that's why it's tagged N2OL mod five. All of these are to all those lists of resources that Donna was sharing. They're all here in one nice place for you. And um, so just to show you where it is, the discussion board for mod five, before you click on it to participate, we put the link right here. So that's for things for you to explore. And um, the last thing I wanted to show you is that Bob Morris, he did he he uses groups in Blackboard a lot. And he did a session back in October that was awesome about how to make and use the group feature in Blackboard. So he, I wouldn't even try to do it. He does it so well and he teaches it. So if, if you are interested, this recording is in the module if you are interested in it. You know, if you're not interested in using the group feature or doing group stuff in Blackboard, then you can skip it. But if, if we've had quite a few requests about it, so we made it part of this module so that you can go ahead and listen to his recording. And here's a link if you wanted to read more about that middle state substantive interaction, there's a link to it there. So that's what really what we're gonna focus on for learning module five. Uh, so you will we'll be looking at the, you know, compliance standards, reviewing the resources for interact, you know, resources to help you with these, all these different ways to do interaction and collaboration. And then look in the Oscar standards for a substantive interaction and, um, you know, come up with either do a, dis a discussion or reflection or other activity in your course that you think could meet that. We are at about uh, 3.52, and that is what I had for you today. So I'm gonna stop now for any questions that you might have. If anybody wants all those links, they can just go into the chat and select everything and copy and paste it into a Word file so you have it. Plus, the I put the link to the slide deck in there. Plus, you can also find that in the course. Yeah, it is right here. All right. Quiet group today. Is everyone else tired too, like me? <laughs> All right. Well, if you don't have any questions, and so far, I did want to say you guys have been doing great. Don and I have been enjoying the, you know, participation and the, the submissions. You've been actively engaged and showing up each week. And we have some that are watching our recordings that can't make our sessions. So um, we thank you all for doing that. The end is getting close. We are on our fifth of six modules. So um, hang in there. We'll, we'll get through to the end. Thank you for joining me today. I will see you live next Wednesday. And I will be engaged uh, a lot with you guys this week because this is a topic that um. I'm very familiar with last week's was Donna's thing. This one, um, Donna is well, Donna's very well versed in these, but I'm, you know, definitely will be participating because this is more of my, uh, one of my areas of expertise as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lisa. All right, everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you.